For years, people have been clamoring for a Fallout movie. It might shock them to know that the closest we've come to having a Fallout movie so far was 20 years ago. This video will serve as a summary of the Fallout movie treatment that was released to The Vault in March 2011 by Brent Friedman, the very same man who wrote it for Interplay back in 1998. Regarding the gameplay you'll see in this video, none of it is relevant to the video. I just needed something to play in the background so I wasn't talking over a black screen. The film opens with a shot of commuters waiting for a train in Los Angeles. They're all reading newspapers, except for our hero. He tells his friend that he's always dreamed of fishing in a creek and actually catching fish. His friend tells him it's not healthy to dream of fish. They board the train, and it heads down the track. The lights go out, leaving the passengers in darkness. The camera zooms out to reveal that the train has only moved 10 feet down the track, and that it's not in Los Angeles. It's in an underground vault, designed to look like a scaled-down version of Los Angeles. Vault 13 is where several thousand people call home. Our hero is not fond of the vault. He frequently disturbs the peace, leading to a female vault security officer tackling him. Later, we see that Hero is an assistant vault supervisor working on supply inventory. He notices a problem with the Gek and reports it to the supervisor, his father. Hero points out that the vault only has 10 days worth of water left. The two take the problem to the elders, a group of seven individuals led by the overseer. These elders were alive before the war 50 years ago, and were supposed to survive until the vault opened 10 years from now. The elders have a plan, but only a select few can know about it. You don't want panic in the vault. An elite group is assembled to tackle the problem. Hero, his friend from the subway, the female vault officer, and a surface scholar. Hero bids farewell to his intended, the woman the vault decided he was to mate with due to genetic restrictions, and prepares for his journey above. Before we go any further, it's important to point out that this movie is set up to take place in 2003, not sometime in the 2100s. You'll see why in just a moment. The group is outfitted with survival kits, weapons, and cash to buy a replacement water chip should they find a radio shack. There's a panning shot of Lancaster, Los Angeles. Buildings destroyed, dust, dirt, debris everywhere, a wasteland. A video feed on the techie's chest relays back to the elders, techie being Hero's friend from the train. They can hear him whining about his pack being too heavy. Techie spots a payphone and sprints towards it, thinking he can use the yellow pages to call someone and order a new water truck. <laughs> techie drops. He's dead. Nearby scavengers laugh, and a gunfight ensues. Our group, with their single-shot weapons, barely defeat the scavengers. Their march towards Vault 8, where they suspect a water trip to be, continues. Intense heat causes them to quickly go through almost all of their water. They ditch their suits to travel faster and lighter. They arrive at Vault 8, the entrance of which was decimated by a battle long ago. All that remains are gigantic 9-foot-tall skeletons. Female finds a tape showing the fight between the inhabitants and humanoid monstrosities. Hero ventures into the vault alone to retrieve the chip. It's not there. He sets off alarms and makes his way through a veritable lethal obstacle course, only to be met by a Mad Max-looking guy who captured the other two members of Hero's scouting party. Max says that he'll get them a new water chip in exchange for their gek. They strike a deal, and Max takes them to the hub, a trading post, on his ATV. A boy with two heads waves at them as they pass by a village. Max calls him a freak. Back at the vault, dwellers are told that Hero and the others are sick and quarantined. Intended, knowing what really happened, is given Hero's old job. She tells her friend what happened, rumors spread, and society inside the vault begins to unravel. Hero and company pass through a jungle where they see mutated children living in the treetops like monkeys. Arriving at the hub, the remains of Beverly Center, a shady valet takes Max's car. Max informs him that the valet is now sitting at a mine, and only Max can turn it off. Weapons are checked at the door. Inside the hub, former stores now sell weapons, supplies, and even human slaves. All eyes are on our scouts, as they look clean and all sorts of fun things could be done with their skin. Max informs them that Vault 13 was the last of the Southern California vaults to open. Scholar learns that cash and credit cards are worthless. 
Hiro spots the scavengers who killed Teki. They're selling his supplies and his organs. A brawl breaks out. Before Max can intervene, female does and kicks some serious ass. They're all arrested and brought before Decker, the hub's mayor. Decker offers them a water chip in exchange for two of their lives, one of which must be female. Max tells him that they'll think about the offer after Hero objects. Hero and Scholar agree to draw straws in the morning to see who gives their life for the vault. Then they head to Decker's private club. Scholar partakes in various female desserts offered, and Hero refuses the advances of a half-mutated woman who wants his pristine bodily fluids. A self-historian introduces himself to Hero, wanting to know more about Vault 13. Historian informs him that it was not China who started the war, it was the vault's creator who launched the first nuke, which caused a panic cascading effect of countries sending out their nukes, leading to World War III. Female tries to seduce Max, who tells her that he came from Vault 8 after mutants attacked their vault and survivors ran off with their geck. Max was sold as a slave to Decker, who helped him build the hub, but he escaped when he was a teenager. Mutants raid the hub. Exits are sealed, word spreads that they're looking for our scouts, and that mutants can't be stopped by bullets. Scholar returns from his sexual escapades with a way to escape the hub. Scholar leads them to Decker and the mutants. Scholar struck a deal with Decker, hero and female, in exchange for weapons and more water chips. Max pulls a gun and puts it to female's head. Negotiations go south, and Max puts a bullet in Decker's heart. Max agrees to give the mutants all three humans and the location of Vault 13, in exchange for a geck. Our scouts are taken into a medical lab holding cell near Cedar Sinai. Scholar is tortured and gives up Vault 13's location. The master, the mutants' leader, wasn't able to get into a vault before the war, so he created forced evolutionary virus, which he is preparing to dunk Scholar into a vat of. Master explains that they stole Gex to create an oasis. Los Angeles becomes a cattle farm for them to harvest humans from, but mutants are sterile, making Hero and Female their last chance at creating non-sterile mutants, the perfectly mutated Adam and Eve. Elsewhere, in a warehouse, Max is given a defective Gek. Mutants don't give a shit, so Max kills them, takes a turboplasma rifle, and heads for our scouts. Hero and Female are walking the plank, preparing to take a dive when Max busts in and rescues them. The vats of FEV are destroyed, but it's too late for Scholar. He's been dunked. As they escape, Max sets off explosives, which destroy tunnels underground. The Scholar Mutant emerges, and Master tells him the plan. The valet was still sitting on the mine. A lethal, high-speed car chase ensues on the twisted remains of the freeway system. The mutants give up at the edge of the Los Angeles Basin. Our heroes arrive to save Vault 13. Upon attempting to re-enter the vault, the overseer denies them access. Turns out, they had all the water chips they needed. This was all about purifying the collective conscious. Discontent is contagious. Worst disease known to vault dwellers, proclaims the overseer, angering the elders. Scholar Mutant, Master, and dozens of mutants are now on the scene. The trio fend them off as best they can until Intended opens the vault door. Overseer didn't like that. Overseer kills Intended. Hero's father lets them back inside, challenges the Overseer, and implores the Elders to arm the Dwellers. A monumental battle begins. Most of the Vault Dwellers die. Hero's father dies in his son's arms. Master recognizes the Overseer as the one who started World War III. Hero takes on Scholar Mutant as Max and Female work together to defeat the Master. Hero leads Scholar Mutant to a trap, where the Mutant is crushed beneath a subway car. The day is won. Hero gives Max their geck and offers to let Max join them in the vault, as Hero doesn't think that the few dwellers that remain, or himself, are ready to leave just yet. Female decides to stay with her people. Surprise! Master wasn't really dead, and he injects Max with the last strain of FEV before Hero finally puts an end to the Master. Max decides to kill himself, but the virus won't let him. Female leads the 50 remaining dwellers out of the vault. A single gunshot is heard, and Hero leaves the vault alone. Hero activates the Gek, which creates a perfect little paradise. Hero and Female have become the new Adam and Eve. The film ends with them and their children fishing in a stream and catching a real fish. And so concludes our little adventure into what could have been. 
I think it's safe to say that we're all much better off with this movie having been cancelled. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.